So our next presenter is Dave Cheda, who will be presenting on using the isoparametric profile as a 2D shape description. Thank you for the introduction, Cynthia. Uh, so the first thing I want to discuss is the isoparametric profile itself. So the isoparametric profile of a shape omega for a given area T is the smallest perimeter of any shape that fits within omega and has area T. So you can see here, I've plotted out the isoparametric profiles of a circle on the left and a perturbed circle on the right. So with the circle, you can see that at each area level, the smallest perimeter shape is simply a smaller circle. And on the right, with the perturbed circle, you'll see that at the lower area values, the smallest perimeter shape is also um, just a circle, but it's at those higher area values that the profile has to account for the perturbations along the boundary. Um, and so the perimeter is, is going to increase. You can see the same difference uh, if you plot out the profiles of the circle and perturbed circle. So once again, they're nearly identical and they only differ at the higher area values. Um, and so this is something we're really interested in because uh, this means that the profile is fairly resistant to perturbations along the boundary of shape. So one of the issues that arises when trying to study the profile is that it's not known whether it can be directly computed in the general case. Uh, in recent years, uh, work has been done to improve the bounds on the profile, and the one that we consider is the morphological opening bound. But before we can discuss that, we need to look at two simpler morphological operations, the erosion and the dilation. So given a structuring element B, uh, which in our case is going to be a disk of some radius, the morphological erosion can be thought of as a subtraction. So this blue shape is our original shape omega, and you can imagine moving this disk along the boundary of our shape and subtracting that region to get the erosion. The morphological dilation uh, is essentially the opposite process in which we move the disk along the boundary of our shape once again, but we add the surrounding region to get the dilation. Now, the morphological opening is the composition of the erosion and the dilation, but a more intuitive way to think about it is, again, given our structuring element, which is a disk of some radius, we are going to move this disk around within our shape and all the points that it can touch are part of our morphological opening. The way this relates to the isoparametric profile is that the profile is bounded from above by the perimeter and area of the morphological opening uh, with respect to a disk of some radius for changing radius. So the first thing we might consider using the profile for is shape classification. And there's a few reasons why we are motivated to do this. So first of all, shape data is in the form of polylines. So that is in the form of a series of connected line segments. And this sort of data is incompatible with most existing machine learning pipelines. Uh, instead, the most popular image classifiers use convolutional neural networks, but these operate on pixelated images. And ideally, we want a descriptor of the shape itself. So we consider a simple data set with seven different types of shapes, and our process is as follows. We compute the morphological opening bounds for each shape, and then we use a multi-layer perceptron, which takes as input the morphological opening bound and attempts to classify the shape into one of these seven classes. After training, we're able to achieve a validation accuracy of 96%, and on the right here, you can see uh, the confusion matrix, um, and there's only one misclassification. For, ref, uh, for context, if we were guessing randomly on a data set with seven classes, our accuracy would be just about 14%. So obviously, um, we're doing a lot better than that. This success motivates us to consider trying using the morphological opening on a more advanced data set. So the next data set we look at is a fonts data set containing a number of fonts, each containing 26 shapes, uh, one for each letter of the English alphabet. So the first thing you'll notice is that each of these fonts are highly stylized. So that means that even for the same shape, so for the same letter, uh, the shapes look really different in different fonts. Uh, and that's gonna impact the accuracy of our classifier. So we follow the same process as before. Um, and after training, we achieve validation accuracy of 25%, which is much lower than what we had before. Um, again, for context, if we were guessing randomly, we have 26 letters, so we would have an accuracy of about 4%. So we're certainly doing better than random guessing, but our low accuracy um, leads us to question whether this is, again, due to just the variation in the data set itself, 
or due to some limitations of the morphological opening bound. So the next thing we try is using the other morphological operations as features for the shapes. And the best morphological classifier that we construct has a validation accuracy of 55%. We also compare this to a convolutional neural network, uh, which is classifying these shapes based on images. And this classifier attains a validation accuracy of 70%. So again, we are seeing that perhaps the morphological operations are not able to capture as much information um, about each shape as just the image of each shape. And one advantage of still using the morphological classifier is that our morphological operations are invariant to rotations. And so if we test our two classifiers on rotated data without any additional training, we'll see that our morphological classifier has 46% accuracy on rotated data, but our convolutional network has only 8% accuracy. Now, I should note that there are ways to combat this uh, problem of rotations in convolutional networks, but they often require specialized architectures. And the key point here is that our morphological classifier is already invariant to rotations without any special uh, techniques being used. So the next thing we might consider using the profile for is as a step in some nonlinear optimization. And in order to do this, we need to compute the gradient of the isoparametric profile. More specifically, we want to compute the gradients of the perimeter and area of the morphological opening, since these are what define the profile. Recall from before that the opening is the composition of the erosion and dilation, and using the chain rule, we find that we can split up this gradient into computing the gradient of the dilation and erosion, respectively. In our study, we focus on computing the, the gradient of the perimeter of the morphological dilation. So the first thing we try is a finite differences approximation. Um, and what this entails is essentially moving each vertex of our shape by a small amount and just observing how the dilation changes. I've plotted the results of that uh, finite differences approximation here. And you'll notice immediately that there are very few non-zero gradient vectors. Um, and this is not an accident. We conjecture that the only non-zero gradient vectors correspond to the, uh, to the convex and concave vertices of our shape. So at the convex vertices, we have these outwards pointing gradient vectors. And at the concave vertices, um, we have gradient vectors which are not at the vertex themselves, um, but still near them. In fact, for convex vertices of the shape, we're able to show that the gradient of the perimeter of the dilation is equal to the gradient of the perimeter of the shape itself, uh, which is a known gradient and can be computed relatively easily. However, we're not sure how to compute the gradient at concave vertices, and this leads us to employ a data-driven approach. So we simulate uh, multiple concave angles and we compute the magnitude of the gradient at each of these concave angles using a finite differences approximation, um, you, uh, as you can see here. And when we plot out the gradient magnitude versus the angle, um, we find that a cotangent model captures uh, this gradient magnitude nearly perfectly. Um, specifically, we conjecture that the magnitude of the gradient of the morphology of the perimeter of the dilation is equal to cotangent of theta over 2, where theta is the convex angle um, at the concave vertex. However, despite this uh, formulation working well for simple shapes, it does seem to fall apart for more complicated shapes. So here, you'll see I've plotted in red the analytic gradient as computed using the formulations found above and the finite differences gradient in green. Um, and while they match it for the most part, there are some discrepancies specifically here near this convex vertex. And we hypothesize that this is due to the fact that our morphological dilation has holes in it, but we're not sure how to account for this uh, discrepancy. In the future, we would like to refine the computation of the gradient of the perimeter of the, the dilation we also still need to compute the gradient of the area of the dilation and the gradient of the erosion in order to find the gradients of the opening. And after that, we would want to use the gradients of the opening in some application. Um, and this could involve many things. Uh, one example is to use this to denoise a shape um, using the, the gradient of the opening or to reconstruct a shape from its morphological opening bound. I would like to thank my mentors, Paul Zhang and Professor Justin Solomon, I would also like to thank my academic tutor, Professor John Rickert, and Rupert Lee, who helped me with this presentation. I want to thank RSI, CE, and MIT, and all the staff involved. And finally, my sponsors, Mr. and Mrs. Ronald D. Birch. 
uh, and I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you so much, Dave, for the interesting presentation. If the judges have any questions, please feel free to unmute yourself. Thanks for the, the nice talk. I was wondering, um, for applications, do you imagine using this notion of the opening at a fixed disk radius, or would you input, say, the whole spectrum of openings across different radii? Uh, thank you for the question. So the question was, uh, when we're looking at the opening, is it at, is it at a fixed uh, a radius or a disk of fixed radius or uh, m many disks of different radii? Um, and the answer is, uh, we are looking at uh, disks of different radii. So specifically, I'll direct your attention again to this upper bound on the isoparametric profile. Um, so the profile is bounded from above by the perimeter of the opening uh, with respect to a disk of some, ra some radius such that the area of that opening is equal to our input parameter t. Um, and so what the morphological opening bound would look like is a plot like this um, of perimeter versus area. Uh, and each of each point on the plot would correspond to a different radius of the disk. I hope that answers your question. Do we have any other questions from the judges? If not, we can maybe take one or two questions, possibly from the rest of the audience, if you guys have questions. I'll ask just one one more. If, uh, if, if yes. real quickly, um, is there anything you can say about, uh, for example, when the morphological opening is itself uh, convex? So, so the question is. Um, can we predict when the morphological opening of a shape, uh, again, with uh, a disk of some radius, is a convex shape? Is that the question? Yes. Okay. Um, not specifically. Um, one, I mean, yeah, so that, that's not something we've considered in our research uh, thus far, um, but it, it's something we could look into. It, uh, I mean, a, a rudimentary answer would just be until you reach um, the perturbations along the boundary. So uh, you can imagine, again, kind of going back to this perturbed circle, our profile isn't going to have to um, have any concave concavities until we reach the concavities in the shape itself. Um, but that's just a conjecture, and we haven't studied that extensively. This is all really interesting sort of abstract shape manipulation to me. I'm not keeping up with the math. But what I would like to know is um, what kinds of industries could really apply this? Is this like a graphical, we can, you know, make new types of alphabets or is it, um, you know, is it helping in some other research fields, uh, you know, matching shapes or proteins or something like that? What are some, some applications of this work? Uh, great. Thank you for the uh, question. So the question was, um, what are the applications of this work, um, you know, beyond just the abstract, uh, abs uh, abstract math? Um, so one idea is to use this, you know, again, kind of similar to what we did with the fonts data set, um, is to use it for handwriting recognition um, uh, or optical character recognition. And so the thing there is that oftentimes we're not going to be looking at images that are upright. Um, they're going to be rotated in, at, you know, different angles. And in that case, we would ideally want some sort of uh, rotation invariant uh, feature. And we could use some morphological operations there. Um, a, another idea would be, rather than looking at characters themselves, trying to recognize text from photos in general, um, which are almost guaranteed not to be upright. Um, and so, again, we would want to use some sort of rotation invariant, rotation and reflection invariant. Um, feature, which is satisfied our, by our morphological operations. I hope that answers your question. I can I can talk a little bit more about other applications if you'd like. Yeah, that's great. I was just thinking about the rotated stop signs we saw earlier. So given that you're getting fairly low accuracy here, I'm wondering whether you still get something that you could then feed into another model. Like, you know, if it's, it, well, for instance, if, you, if it said, okay, this is, pro I think it's an A, but it might be a V or something like that. If you then could feed that if you got information, you could then feed into a model that actually knows something about what language the text is likely to be in and could say, okay, it's not going to be a V because it follows a, an X or something like that. And yeah, that, that's, that's definitely something to consider. So for with, specifically um, with uh, looking at kind of text recognition, um, that would likely be one of the best ways to implement that because um, we would want to combine the actual shape recognition with a uh, language model as well. Um, we haven't, we didn't uh, look at that in our research specifically, but it would be something to look at in future work. 
Um, and I should point out, uh, kind of as you implied, our outputs are our output is a probability vector. So we, if you know, we can say, well, this is most likely to be an A, but it's second most likely to be a V or something. Um, and we could we could look at, for example, the K best predictions um, and choose which one makes the most sense in context. All right, thank you so much, Dave.